are looking for a mobile wallet to hold and access your crypto assets, you need to go to Argent.xyz and download the Argent Smart Contract Wallet onto your Android or iOS device. Argent is one of the most secure ways to hold your crypto assets on your mobile device while still being able to access all the DeFi products and services that we know and love. Argent has enabled one tap access to all the DeFi applications that we all use the most and recently onboarded into the Argent app is the YEARN vaults. You can now access yield from a specific vault from YEARN and then YEARN handles the rest. Also new to Argent is Balancer and being able to supply liquidity to Balancer pools and also receive BAL rewards for doing so all from your Argent wallet. One of Argent's newest features is the ability to route trades and swaps through the various liquidity pools in the ecosystem, ensuring that you always receive the best rates when you trade inside of Argent. Argent has done a ton of effort into making sure that your assets are as safe as possible. They have social recovery options with their guardians feature, making sure that any trusted friend or family member can restore your access back to your Argent wallet if you were to ever lose or break your phone. And there's also some simple account features such as sending limits and whitelisted accounts, making sure that your money doesn't ever do anything that you don't explicitly approve. In order to see the Argent wallet in action, go to argent.link slash bankless and download the app. We're also brought to you by Monolith. Monolith is your cool new DeFi account, your DeFi savings account, your DeFi checking account. Except the cool thing about the Monolith DeFi account is that it gets software updates, right? You actually get to increase the usefulness of this over time. So here are some of the features. Monolith is a smart contract wallet with a lot of the features that you would expect if you've come to know DeFi and what it is, you can you can add money to it. You can put that money to work uh, in compound and, and accessing yield. Uh, but you can and you can also swap through Uniswap. What was cool with Monolith is that they will send you a very sexy Monolith Visa card that connects to your smart Monolith smart contract wallet on Ethereum. So it's a really awesome tool to live a bankless life with a a, a savings account that gets software updates. So this is, this is something that you're never going to find out in the real world, but you can still do real world things with you know real money in, like buy your groceries. So that's just fantastic. Coming soon to Monolith, actually already here to Monolith, is now you can buy DAI and get it sent to your wallet directly, right? So it's also being an on-ramp. So you don't have to go through your centralized exchange like Coinbase or Gemini or wherever. You can just go straight from your bank account right into your Monolith checking account smart contract wallet. So check them out at monolith.xyz. Bankless Nation, welcome to this special Ask Me Anything. This is your opportunity to ask our next guest anything. We are so pleased to have James Ferguson, who is the CEO of Immutable. That is the company behind Gods Unchained, which is an Ethereum-based NFT game that he's going to talk a little bit about. James, it's fantastic to have you. Welcome to the Bankless Nation, sir. Fantastic. Yeah, I am thrilled to be here. And I want to take this opportunity to say that I am a legit fan of the Bankless <laughs> Ooh, podcast like nation and everything that you guys are doing. Well, what you can't see there is maybe James has a Bankless shirt. We don't know yet. Right? <laughs> like maybe he's got Bankless <laughs> under that black. Uh, anyway, welcome. We're super excited to have you guys. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, which is a fantastic place to watch this, hit that like button. Uh, that gives more exposure to the Ask Me Anything and spreads the word. You can also ask questions in YouTube. David's going to help field those. If you are a Bankless member and if you are part of the Inner Circle Discord, you can ask questions there too. We will prioritize those questions. This is an opportunity for you, obviously, to ask questions. David and I have a few of our own too. James, why don't we start with this question? Do you think games, video games in particular, are the key to mainstreaming the world to crypto? That's been in the back of my mind. That's a big question in my mind. What do you think? I truly believe that games can be one of the Trojan horses by which we get crypto into people's minds and by which we essentially change the model of ownership that people have in people's minds. So. Obviously, we've got a couple of people, I'm sure, who are listening who are very into games. Uh, the number in the world is rapidly rising, but it's hard to overstate uh, just how big gaming is. So in terms of industry size, last year, it was about $100 billion was spent 
uh, $150 billion was spent on video games and $100 billion of that was spent on items in those video games which people didn't actually own. Wait, James, so you said $150 billion was spent and of that $100 billion? $100 billion of $100 that? $100 billion. So only $50 billion was spent on, you know, CDs or game ownership. The majority, $100 billion was spent on Candy Crush gems right. and Fortnite skins and right. Dota characters, oh which God. people don't own. They only have a license to use it on a centralized account. So that's crazy. I mean, the gaming industry must have changed, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sound a little old man here, but like in the days of like Diablo 2, when I was playing, people didn't buy like in item games mm -hmm. we, we went out and we like we bought the the cd rom and we loaded it in our pc right and we played that way this was even prior to the kind of um pay as a, a subscription model of gaming so it feels like gaming must have changed completely, completely in the last 15 to 20 years completely so with the advent of new distribution methods mainly mobile and social from that point people made their games free and just constantly monetize the same audience by trying to hype them up and then take money for enjoyment. Whereas essentially what we get to do in the blockchain space is flip that model on its head. The analogy I like to think of is, uh, let's have a look at the real estate market. How much money on the world is spent renting versus how much money is spent on the housing market, buying and trading houses? And if you, the only option was renting, the amount of money would, that was spent would be less and we're offering way less value to people. We're currently treating gamers as second class citizens. And the way that most like big games companies try to deal with it is hype them up, take as much money as possible rather than empowering the players by creating this new market that they can play in and making the items that they actually own be meaningful economically. So wow. James, let's go into the model of Gauze Unchained because I think that will provide a lot of context with what we are uh, talking about with the flipping on the head of the model of ownership, right? So, so Gauze Unchained, for those that, that um, aren't familiar, is very similar to Magic the Gathering. Uh, and it's also very similar to Hearthstone and it has some of the best features of both. And so with Magic the Gathering, you have physical cards and you play against a person sitting across from you. And you actually do have self-sovereign ownership over those physical cards uh, because they're physical, right? In the same way that you have self-sovereign ownership over cash. Now, Hearthstone is um, uh, the game from Blizzard, which is very much similar to Magic the Gathering, but it's done virtually. It's all on the computer. And when you own, when you purchase those cards and like... Hearthstone is a cash cow for Blizzard. They make a ton of money for Blizzard. Hearthstone made, in the last year that they reported, they made $400 million right. selling cards to people which they don't own right. in their pay here. So you, you buy them and they are associated with your account and you get to access them and use them in play. But you can't trade them with other people like Magic the Gathering cards because they're locked to your account, right? And uh, and so you own you you own your account, but but your but Blizzard really controls everything. How does Hearthstone or excuse me, how is Gauze Unchained similar to both of these models, and how is it different? Awesome. So essentially, it's take the best parts of both. So what's nice about uh, Hearthstone is you've got a game that's quite accessible. Uh, you've got a game that's so simple. You don't need to remember the moves. It's on the computer. It's easy to find someone else to play against. Uh, but they've got this, you know, sort of scammy free-to-play model of playing. Uh, Magic the Gathering is a great game. It's a bit more complex. Our game lies in between the two uh, in terms of complexity. Uh, and what's nice is you can actually collect these cards. You own them. You can trade them with your friends. However, it's in the physical world and infrastructure for trading physical items, it's pretty weak, right? Maybe you go to your local uh, game shop, which is where you play and you can trade against local people, but there's no reason that you can't combine both of them together and have digital ownership. So essentially you need the blockchain for that, but also you can build amazing infrastructure that allows you know a grand exchange of all these items to be traded constantly and get the best of both worlds. So uh, the way I like to say this is, is like you get to have your digital versions of cash and now you also get to have your digital versions of, you know, your favorite trading card game, right? And so it's, it's like a bare instrument 
it, like how Bitcoin is a new bearer instrument, except now it's done on a, not, instead of a, being a card in your hand, it's a card on a blockchain, right? So when you purchase these things, you actually receive assets, right? When you purchase Goss and chain cards, tokens show up in your Ethereum wallet. And that's like the big difference between Goss and chain and Hearthstone. When you purchase something, you just get something on a centralized database that could be wiped. With Gauze Unchained, tokens show up in your Ethereum wallet. And that means that, like, in addition to all those benefits, there's also the DeFi backend, which they get to tap into just like everything else. And that's a whole different story. But as far as with, like, ownership, it's just a huge order. In the, in the same way that, like, cash is being upgraded, now, like, ownership over these types of cards are also getting that same sort of, like, special treatment from a public blockchain. Exactly. And it's not... I, I really like the description of uh, ETH as programmable money, right? And it's clear that programmable money is going to change the world so fundamentally. But you can think of NFTs as programmable bearer instruments, right? So it's not just uh, I own this card, but we can add in extra rules. We can program certain levels of rarity. They are counterfeit proof. They're like fraud proof. They are like we've been having discussions internally about uh, as we build out the new our new uh, tech to be able to allow better trading of them, what? How can we increase liquidity? How can we put characteristics of these bearer instruments and program them in so that we can allow more seamless trading? So we can allow the DeFi world to go crazy and create you know whatever they want derivatives off them. Uh, this is the way the world will go. We're just building the fundamental building blocks in place first, and building a great game at the same time. And that great game is really important because at the end of the day, if you just have a collectible or an item that nobody wants, uh, there's no utility for it in the you know traditional gaming sense, then the demand is going to be capped. Uh, it's non-negotiable for us, at least, that you have to build a top tier quality game around it. So the beauty of this is the player is really in control, right? So software and bankless, when it comes to, to money and finances, we talk about this, this concept of, of self-sovereign money, right? And that is, uh, to me, the definition of like freedom, right? Like you actually own your money as a bearer instrument. You, you know, you can do with it what you will. This is essentially bringing this to game assets and, and game items. So the player receives all of the upside, all of the benefit. They have the complete freedom of a real world economy to do with what they will, like th these assets, they can trade them, they could leverage them, they could maybe put them in a, in a maker CDP. Who knows all the possibilities that the DeFi economy will empower. And like, you guys don't even have to, to create all of those possibilities because DeFi and the community is kind of doing it for you once the assets are valuable. Is that right? So we have at this time, just for Gods Unchained, because, you know, in order to support uh, this ecosystem, we open up our APIs, et cetera. We make all this information available because we love encouraging the community to build. So I'd say that there is probably about 15 to 20 different simple web apps uh, that exist around Gods Unchained. But there's All right, probably if you want to five and eight really complex apps that people right, have built, bank. like this extra infrastructure on top of it. Uh, there's amazing marketplaces. There's amazing like score trackers. There's things which are much, much simpler, like do you prefer this art or this art? Uh, do yeah. you prefer like which card's better, this one or this one? At the same time, people are going, like are starting to explore what it looks like to plug in these different uh, assets into the DeFi ecosystem, right? So I am convinced that one day and one day soon, right? We need to solve some fundamental problems around allowing liquidity and scaling for the trading of goods because it's actually a more difficult problem than even uh, scaling and trading of fungible items. Mm -hmm. But once we have that infrastructure in place, this is going to explode. And whenever there's a market for something, there's always markets for derivatives. So I'm looking forward to the world in which one day there's a you know, Goldman Sachs desk. Uh, Goldman Sachs probably being less important at this time than it currently is. Uh, but there's a Goldman Sachs desk who's trying to keep up with the world and they are opening up a long position on a index of nature cards in God's Unchained uh, outperforming 
uh, the maybe a war index and shorting the war index. And I really think not only will we have that sort of world, but once we have the right building blocks in place, it's inevitable. Instead of a Goldman Sachs desk, it might be some uh, YFI governors or something <laughs> to that effect. In the oh, future. that will happen much earlier. That will happen <laughs> yeah. much earlier. Well, so here, here's the thing that's amazing, right? Like, so I am blown away in the world of gaming uh, by the community's capacity and all of these gaming communities to just mod. Like they mod, they add, and they do this all because of their passion for the game, just for fun, right? Like what happens when you add crypto economic incentives to the modding. So if I own my own assets, I own, let's say, gods and chained assets, right? I'm not only having fun, I'm not only a part of this really cool community, I've got some upside if I start building gods unchained apps. Maybe I've got even a, a business or a career for, from doing it and trading it. I can I can create my own economy. That has got to like put some 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 like I guess gasoline on the fire of all of the modding that we've already seen in the past for games that, that gamers are just doing for free. So the way we think about it internally is there are three key loops that we want to uh, grow essentially. And we do this via empowering different people in the ecosystem around these items. The first one of these is play to earn. The second one is share to earn. And the third one is create to earn. Huh. Uh, so play to earn is obvious. You know, uh, what's really nice is if you are playing a game and you are earning items in that game that can be sold for real money, you're essentially earning. And uh, the economics behind this aren't actually that crazy. Essentially, uh, as we were talking before about the free to play uh, business model, essentially the vast majority of players in free to play play for free and 10% of them pay and 1% of them, the whales pay a lot, right? So it's this big curve. What play to earn essentially does is shifts the curve just down slightly so that instead of most players playing for uh, free, it's actually most players earn. And then it, the economics still works because you end up getting way more players and it's still the, the whales who are sort of helping create this whole system and providing value into it. What is super cool is that there are two other uh, loops that we're building out. So the share to earn system where the more people you bring in, obviously you're helping grow the ecosystem. So we want to incentivize that and help all participants in this ecosystem prosper. And the final one is exactly what you said, Ryan, around modding. How can we allow people who create and create pieces of uh, either infrastructure or items or value around this ecosystem? How can they earn it in the game? And there's some amazing things which we're exploring here. So obviously you have the creation of UGC. Uh, user generated content which could be uh put into an nft or a clip of primary or secondary trading value that happens uh when an nft is traded through something so what we're building out with uh immutable x our exchange is we're very interested in allowing anyone who builds an app that interfaces with it they should get their share of the value and because all of ethereum is programmable at the value layer whether it's programmable money or programmable items, we can do that and we can allow all participants to be aligned and to win. This is super cool. And this is not all that foreign, of course, uh, to crypto because that's exactly how systems like Ethereum and Bitcoin work. Like you could think of like the, uh, the play to earn as I'm running a miner, I'm running a validator, I'm playing the crypto economic game of Ethereum and I'm winning Ether. Uh, so very cool. That model seems to work. I want to ask a question that I heard a lot in 2018 and 2019 about this idea of NFTs in games. Um, some people have said it's actually like overhyped, right? Not saying I necessarily uh, agree with that, but the, the objection that I've heard is, okay, so Hearthstone, as you said, James, they're making 400 million a year right now. Fortnite, God knows how many billions they're making selling these digital games. So the objection I've heard previously has been, okay, so you're saying, Ryan, you're saying, James, these NFTs are going to be huge, right? But like these companies are making so much money right now 
they're never going to change their business model. Hearthstone is never going to give up that 400 million a year prize. Epic is never going to give up their, their V bucks and all of the skins that they're selling. What's your response to that, James? It's the ultimate innovators dilemma, right? If, if we were making uh, like, Three and a half billion dollars, I think, was the peak amount annualized that Fortnite made of money. That's a crazy amount, right? So if you're Epic and you're making that amount of money, there is no way you want to switch over to a different business model. You are winning based off this business model. But what is super interesting is that uh, ultimately, just like any sort of innovator's dilemma, when you deliver way more value to the consumer, everyone has to adapt eventually. So we have users who, uh, we have quite a lot of users in Gods Unchained who have come over, not from the blockchain scene at all. They have just come directly from the trading card game genre scene because uh, we do a bit of marketing there as well. And once they understand, this is one of my favorite quotes that I ever read uh, from a player in our Discord was that they felt physically sick when they went back to go purchase cards in Hearthstone. <laughs> They felt physically sick when they realized what they were actually doing. They got and red And at the same time, yeah, exactly. They've been red killed for what ownership actually means. And at the same time, it's not just blockchain games currently that are looking at this space. Uh, most of the big games have an eye on it. We're in contact with all these, you know, giant companies and they're very interested to see how it shakes out and when they'll have to adapt. But I'll tell you who is the most interested the mid-tier games. Gaming is such a power law that the higher up you are on the popularity chart, the more money you make by far. So really, really successful games make billions, but if you're only you know, the thousandth most successful game or the hundredth most successful studio, you don't make that much money. And all of these games are, and studios are fascinated in anything that can give them an edge and move them up and this ages via giving more value to their consumers, more value to their players, and ultimately al aligning the incentives so that more people are able to, uh, they can distribute their game to more people. So this model is going to force the incumbents to change. The only reason they're able to get away with these business models right now is because basically crypto economic gaming where a player owns their own assets does not exist yet, but is now coming and is now emerging. Exactly. I would say there will still be relics of the old model for sure. Um, obviously having true ownership doesn't really give much value if it's a single player game. So there are, there are still gonna be, you know, huge parts of the game industry which continue down the path that they're going. But for multiplayer, multiplayer games and for games in which community status and ownership and trading and interacting with each other matter, then so does value transfer all between people. And those ones are the ones which are going to be transformed. James, I want to get to um, some Ethereum and, and scaling related question, but I also want to bring up, because um, I'm on the periphery of the, of the gaming world, I, I tend to pay a little bit of attention to what's going on. And the, from what I gather and, and what I want to ask you about is there seems to be a, a decent amount of like disgruntledness from game and developers when they end up getting put under like the hut of just like Blizzard or EA or, you know, something that has to really meet a bottom line. And from what I've, from the, the sense I'm getting is like, there's a lot of game developers who feel like they've lost the spirit of gaming because they're under these gargantuan, just like, uh, you know, factories of, you know, Call of Duty and FIFA and just like pumping out the same thing and the same business model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I would imagine that there's a high, very high number of developers who already know how to code. So like that's already a step in the right direction who are ready to like figure out how to start doing something on their own with maybe a new platform or, or a, a new uh, paradigm of game design. Maybe you could speak about that. And if my hunch is, is off or correct on that. So you're absolutely correct. So far, the, the state that some of the more established parts of gaming is in is there, it's a reasonably mature industry, which is undergoing consolidation. And on top of that, people are trying to compete on cost structures, right? Making a game is a risky endeavor. Uh, this means, you know, 
I think it would, would have been yesterday uh, at the time this is filmed or yesterday for Australia, um, that uh, Cyberpunk, so gigantic game, I think they haven't released any numbers yet, yet but I guess that they've in this sort of 20, 48 hours made more than half a billion dollars uh, selling this game. But their devs have been under the crunch for like almost six months, like working six days a week, 12 hour days. I'm sure some of them working seven days a week. Um, so it's a pretty brutal environment if you're working at some of the top tier, uh, top tier bottom line focused publicly traded companies. Uh, at the same time, people in the games industry are so creative and they have not just creative in that they can think up amazing ideas, but they have a will to create as well and a drive to create. And so if they can see a way where indie games can start participating in a new economy that maybe is more, uh, you know, doesn't have the same sort of gigantic costs that it, it takes to get involved uh, at the early stage. And secondly, they can build a community in a game more organically and allow monetization along the way rather than like, right, let's spend $50 million building this thing as cheaply as possible and work everyone to the ground and then release this and, you know, keep on running it uh, from that point if it's a hit. Uh, if we can offer an alternative, I am sh sure, and we're getting a lot of inbound uh, like requests of people who are very interested in moving over to exploring this new greenfield. Well, I am excited for that world to get explored because, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm gaming less and less these days, and that's because I can't really find anything to resonate with. And so maybe maybe that's a problem that blockchain can solve. Um, speaking of blockchain, uh, back in 2017, CryptoKitties clogged the entire Ethereum network, right? And <laughs> brought it to a halt. And that has been like a, much of a, a talking point for P Ethereum naysayers. Then a year or maybe it was two years later, later Gauze and Chain released all of their NFTs, and it didn't do anything to the Ethereum network. It didn't clog it at all. Uh, so let's talk about that before slash after event. Like, how did you guys figure out how to get what you needed to have gotten done under the constraints of uh, Ethereum's limited scale? And then once we once we get to that point, we'll talk about um, where you guys are going now with even further scaling. Awesome. So I don't know with the exact number of kitties off my head, but I'm pretty sure that the exact, like the rough number is a few hundred thousand. Um, the same with a couple of other popular games. Most of them have somewhere between 10,000 and a few hundred thousand items. Uh, and these are tokens, got, right? Tokens. These are tokens yeah. and non-fungible tokens. And, and non-fungible right. tokens are way less efficient to transact. Right. This is because, you know, uh, I can maybe on Uniswap or I could send you, if I had it, I wish, uh, a million bucks worth of some token mm -hmm. uh, and only pay a small, like a $5 fee. And if five bucks on a uh, million dollar trade, sure. it's not that bad. It's actually probably beats most of the uh, you know traditional world. Mm -hmm. However, if you need to pay that fee per every single unit, which is the way non-fungible tokens work because they're all unique, then you start, uh, it starts getting pretty punitive pretty quickly. Uh, there have been a couple of attempts to try and solve this. So one of the standards ERC1155 is sort of a, a multi-fungible or a semi-fungible standard, but essentially the way they get a bit more scalability is by sacrificing part, uh, part of the non-fungibility and uniqueness. So it's sort of like having many, many different ERC20s. Mm. Uh, what we did when we created, so Gods Unchained has 7 million uh, cards, roughly. Uh, we, why did we go with this number? Why haven't we gone with you know, uh, fewer, more expensive items? Our goal at Gods Unchained is to take it mainstream. We're not here to just you know, make a profitable niche crypto game. It's not interesting to us. We're here to show the world the power of true ownership. And that means that you need cheaper items in there, especially if we want to have a true way to earn them. So uh, when we created a huge stack of these for the first time, we used a pretty interesting way of essentially like compressing the data uh, in a way that, so this was some internal R&D that was since shared on how to do it, but it allowed the creation of these items to offset a lot of the gas costs to later. Where to next, right? Where to next? Essentially uh, from this moment and even before, we have realized that in order to hit our ambitions for Gods Unchained, we need to make creation of assets 
creation of NFTs and trading of NFTs be scalable. And we wanted to do it in, and I think a lot of different people have had this idea. I think a lot of people know that gaming and these digital goods, uh, the trading of them is going to be big. Uh, unfortunately, the way pretty much everyone else has decided who's taken it seriously to try and beat this uh, has been to try and compete with Ethereum. So you either have new blockchains, which are generalized purpose blockchains. So, you know, I remember even Tron claimed that they had a gaming fund at one point. Uh, and they're like, Tron will be the home of gaming. Or you've got newer ones who have tried to build their own blockchain or sidechain, uh, like Flow, who wants to try and be the home of this as well. But for us, what Ethereum has is something beautiful. And it's that there are no VCs who, it's not a centralized entity, it's arisen organically and we wanted to work out a way that we could get scaling for ethereum and on ethereum rather than either a side chain which is essentially just a separate blockchain with a bridge or a separate blockchain which is essentially even if many of them are, are you know trying to for branding reasons and trying to win over the ethereum community claiming that they're going to be symbiotic and friends ultimately they're in competition so we wanted to build a solution that would allow instant and gasless trading on Ethereum. Uh, so we've been pretty hard at work over the entire year building out uh, Immutable X, uh, which I guess would be a, a, probably now a good time to give a quick summary of it. Yeah, tell us, tell us about Immutable yeah, keep X. Keep going, don't stop. <laughs> awesome. So how do you solve the uh, how do you solve this problem which exists? How do you solve scalability? And ultimately what scalability gives you, which is liquidity for NFTs. And this is what we've been thinking about. And uh, I know that you guys have interviewed Vitalik quite a few times. One of the things that uh, Vitalik believes and so do we very firmly is that ZK rollups and just rollups are the way that Ethereum for now wins and the mm -hmm. way that uh, it's gonna be built out. Essentially any other solution you know, a brand new blockchain, a side chain is just too insecure. Uh, they're either, they sacrifice security or centralization at the end of the day. However, if you can use zero knowledge rollups to batch multiple transactions together, you can keep the security of Ethereum's main chain without having to compromise. And so, uh, you know, I think in the ERC20 world, people are, have been exploring this for a little bit. Everyone's excited by it. Uh, and some people have gone down the optimistic roll-up route and some people have gone down the uh, ZK roll-up route. Uh, in the NFT world, you can only go down the ZK roll-up route. Really? I did not know that. It's super interesting because uh, essentially one of the big difference is a fraud proof and a validity proof, right? Which they operate on. And uh, when you publish a proof to the chain, does it need to be challenged or do you know that it's correct immediately? And with ZK rollups, you know that it's correct immediately. For ERC20s and fungible tokens, it doesn't really matter that uh, they can be challenged and can be reverted later on because the company that's behind it can just float you the money. And if it's reverted, they can try and claim that back later. But if you want to use a scaling optimistic rollup and you've got hundred thousand dollars of die that you want to withdraw from it that's fine even though it will take two weeks to confirm uh the company can just loan you that take it take what is fair to run that cost and cover that risk and it's a fantastic user experience for you mm -hmm. if you wanted to take a god's unchained card out of a roll-up in order to use it to collateralize you know something on compound uh when they allow that or you know to interact with the DeFi world some way. Could you imagine needing to wait two weeks until <laughs> it was confirmed enough to actually use it on the main chain? No, the whole point of this is that we want to finally offer people the native like experience that they're used to. And so it has to be uh, a zero knowledge roll up. Very, so, so, so that's what you're building then. That's what Immutable X is, right? That it's a zero knowledge roll up and you're partnering with Starkware? Starkware. Yes. Okay. Um, so the team at Starkware is incredible. Uh, they have built some amazing proving functionality around Starks. And what we've been using is taking this tech and using it to build out the best possible protocol for creating and exchanging non-fungible tokens possible. And our big goal here, 
the driving like thought for the company uh, is how can we allow liquidity to exist here? So we've got a couple of really cool innovations which we have uh, built and have on the rollout, rollout map. Uh, so a couple of these are, when you're trading on Immutable X, uh, essentially you get instant and zero gas fee trading. That is like, as someone who has dealt a lot with the blockchain world, it almost feels magical being able to click and see it uh, confirm instantly while you know that you're still interacting with the blockchain. So that has been huge. And that's one of the, the first things that we're gonna roll out. Uh, next, we're going to work out, we're in the process of working out the right incentives so that this becomes really popular, uh, as well as allowing it to work for all games and all apps. We don't necessarily want to, uh, you know, we're not interested in hogging, trying to hog the space. We're building this as a protocol, which anyone can plug into, the open seas, the rareables, the anyone who's in this NFT space, and they can get their fee and their share for bringing their users uh, and the demand uh, and interacting with this protocol. A couple of things we have on the longer term roadmap, which we are incredibly excited about, is the idea of a metadata slash characteristic virtual market. So what do I mean by this? This is one of the, I think that when this releases, it will be one of the biggest innovations that's probably happened in trading for a while. But essentially, because every NFT is unique, when you want to trade it, you create an order in an individual market for each one, right? If I want to buy uh, a certain golden ratify God's Unchained card, then I start having a look, you know, you can have a good UX where you can search and be like, right, filter, only gold, let's have a look. And I can see what the prices are, uh, which have been listed, but they're all actually separate markets. If I don't like what's offered there, then I have to create a, you know, buy order for each of them. And you can filter to be able to see it. What we're building out though, is the ability that we have the metadata and the characteristics of each of these unique items uh, encoded, and we can create virtual markets, not for the item itself, but for any item which matches the characteristics which a person wants. So an example would be, I could create a buy order to buy any golden ratify card in God's Unchained, or any golden card in God's Unchained, or any card in God's Unchained. And when you get this, you start being able to drop between different levels of specificity and create more liquidity at all levels. While it's still just, you know, you list your card for sale at the price that you want to be able to sell it for. And it will essentially be able to be automatically dropped into every single one of these markets automatically. And that's where this stuff starts going crazy. Uh, we won't have this released at launch, but it's one of the big initiatives that we're going to push out next year and what we're so excited about. Okay, so I just want to carry carry the listeners through the process of, of the, the, the the evolution of, of the immutable platform that we've just gone through. Immutable used to have and still does has all the tokens on L1, and you guys figured out a way to uh, you said compress, and I really like that word compress the data needed to get the job done. And that's actually I think a really underappreciated way to scale a blockchain is by co the compressing of data rather than by the, and then increasing the scale. We can figure out more creative ways to compress data, and that's like actually the very Bitcoiner way to scale a blockchain. But, and, and that was great, and that worked out. And the, the next problem you guys seem to run into is that uh, one of the greatest features about Gauze Unchained is that um, if you are missing a card in your deck and you want to complete your deck, you can just go and buy it. And that's great uh, because that gives you the freedom and expressivity you, can't, you need to be able to create any deck that you want. And this is the problem that I ran into where I would go and I wanted to go buy like three or four cards. If you tallied them all together, it would cost me like $20 to purchase the cards, but it would also cost me like $35 in gas to purchase the cards. Exactly. And so as a player, I was like, hmm, that's like, this, yeah, yeah, that doesn't feel right. I don't want that. Um, David doesn't like to spend his ETH either. <laughs> yeah, I don't like I don't to spend know if you my know ETH. This about him. Yeah, no, I like to keep my ETH. Spend my die, but keep my ETH. And so you guys are now heading on that problem head on with the Immutable X platform, which is on a, which is a ZK rollup. 
so you guys can generate the infrastructure that you need to support a marketplace for Gaza and chain cards. And that probably just it has a much more um, seamless quality of life experience that the average gamer is ready to accept. And, and so they let's, don't want... uh, let's have a look at what this looks like. <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, I was playing a game the other day after we did our latest update. I played against a very cool deception deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, they romped me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, damn, I want that. Mm-hmm. I want that deck. In the future, as soon as that game has finished, you'll be able to click mm. buy all of this. Add to cart. <laughs> add to cart. Instantly click it. You've got it. It's in your deck. Then eventually you'll be able to scroll through the deck and be like, oh, well, this card um, I like to show off when I play. So I want all my cards to be decked out in gold uh, or diamond. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do that by buying more cards and essentially forging them together into a version. Mm-hmm. So maybe... As I'm looking through, I'm like, you know what? These are the best cards. Uh, click on this one, upgrade to diamond or upgrade to gold. It immediately searches the marketplace for this in one transaction without paying any like gas fees on that. It can buy them all and merge them into that gold card and then put it back in the deck. And it will just feel like an app for people. And that is the benefit of a of a, a Starkware L2, right? Or or or, or a optimistic rollup L2, or an L2 in general, because that is done on a centralized database, right? Because that's how Starkware and, and rollups are run. It's one centralized database with cryptographic commitments to Ethereum, and so you exactly. do get the the uh, tr- the treatment as a gamer that you would expect, because there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to do that in a centralized database way. And so there's no reason why you can't do that on a Starkware L2. So essentially, rather than us storing ownership, Mm -hmm. we take cryptographic signatures from people saying, yes, I'm trading this. Mm -hmm. And then we update the state in our database. Mm -hmm. And every, you know, 30 minutes, hour or so, we send that all back together Mm -hmm. to the smart contract. And it updates it on the main chain. At the same time, uh, if people want to update it faster, they can. Mm -hmm. Uh, If people want to withdraw, they always can. Cool, cool. And and the last component that I'm really stoked about is that Immutable X, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is not a platform for just Gods Unchained. It is a platform, right? Anyone can tap into this. And so that what really gets me riled up is like, you there's there's a choice that people have been making over the last like two years do you figure out how to scale ethereum or do you figure out how to build your own blockchain and you guys are going with how do we scale ethereum route in like keeping keeping it under the fold of ethereum keeping it under you know the quote unquote the right ecosystem uh because ethereum is the magical thing that we wanted to and so you guys are doing the hard route of scaling ethereum and it even seems to be like you guys have succeeded in that before a bunch of other players have have built their own blockchain so congratulations for that did i get all that right exactly tell tell Um, us tell us about how immutable x is a platform for not just gods unchained so we want to make sure that uh the way we conceptualize of immutable x is essentially as the liquidity pool and protocol for non-fungible items so unique items uh that means we are extremely the more people on it as well the more the benefit towards Ethereum actually accrues, right? Because you get to save even more and more uh, gas costs as more items are moved into this layer two. And you get the benefit of Gods Unchained, like cards can instantly be traded against another game's cards if they're on it, etc. So we're currently talking to most of the players in the space. Everyone's super excited because people don't want to leave Ethereum. But some people have been considering it. Uh, you know, there are other blockchains who are waving dollars in front of people's faces and saying not only this we will solve your like scalability solution they haven't necessarily built it out in a way that proves that it works that they will but they're you know trying to dangle this in front of people and so there's a real like fight going over for developers mindshare that currently exists right now and we want ethereum to win we don't want it to be split up so that you know uh nft exists nft users and applications all exist on this one chain and uh, maybe DeFi lives on this other chain. We want it all to be interoperable and have all the value on one because that's when you get so many more benefits. And at the same time, Ethereum is essentially under attack uh, on this front. And we know that the tech exists. Uh, We've built it to allow Ethereum to win and to allow users to have an experience way better than they ever thought. 
And we don't want, you know, promises by other VC back chains or side chains to be able to take people away from this, you know, community effort that we're all trying to build. James, that was absolutely fantastic. There are a ton of questions pouring in on the YouTube, uh, in the YouTube chat. So we definitely want to get to a lot of these questions. Uh, the the Gauss and Chain community is here and they have questions. Uh, before we get to that, though, we're going to take a moment and talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. If you want to live a bankless life, you need to get a hardware wallet. There is no alternative for storing your crypto in a self-sovereign fashion. That's why I have four ledgers that I use to manage my different crypto assets using the Ledger Live account as well. Ledger Live is like your home base for managing your Ethereum, DeFi, and crypto accounts. It does a really good job of aggregating all of your different Ethereum wallets if you are the type of person that uses more than one. But you can also add other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Cosmos or whatever your preferred blockchain is. And then it will display an aggregate portfolio of all your accounts at the main page. One thing that Ledger is doing a really good job of is enabling all the money verbs that me and Ryan talk about with the Bankless Skill Cube enabled in the Ledger Live app. So right now in the Ledger Live app, you can buy, sell, lend, swap, and stake your crypto assets, which is doing a really good job of fulfilling all of the money verbs in the Bankless Skill Cube. Something that's new to Ledger Live is Ledger Swap, where you can swap assets one for another directly inside the Ledger Live application, ensuring trustlessness in your financial activity on Ethereum and on Bitcoin. If you want to learn more about what you can do with a Ledger, go to the blog post, The Power of Ledger Live on the Ledger website, where they share some of the more advanced things that you can do with your Ledger that you might not have known about. There's a link in the show notes that will take you to the Ledger shop where you can get your preferred Ledger hardware wallet. I personally like the Ledger Nano X, but I also have both. They're both great options. When you own a Ledger, you own your own assets in the way that they have been designed to be held by the user and the user alone. So go get your Ledger today to make sure that you are as self-sovereign as possible. The Bankless State of the Nations are brought to you by Wiren. Wiren is DeFi's first self-building community-run project, which I just get really, really excited about. Wiren is a system that seeks out yield in DeFi, and it does that in a number of different ways. Well, a very aggressive way is with the vaults, where you can deposit your preferred asset of choice, and different DeFi experts will come in and generate a strategy for what to do with your deposited token, right? And so it'll go find ways to get yield in that deposited token in DeFi. For those who want to just earn yield on their stable coins, the earn system is for you, where you can deposit your preferred stable coin and Wiren will go and figure out which money market on DeFi, and DeFi is producing the best interest rate, whether it's DYDX, it's Compound or Aave. It, it looks around DeFi to see where the yield is coming from and it directs stable coins automatically so you don't have to. Check them out at yearn.finance to get started and also check out the stats page to see what other people are doing as well. All right, guys, we are back with James Ferguson, CEO of Immutable, and we are answering questions from the Bankless YouTube. So now is the time to get the questions in. Some people have already been asking them, so I've got a few of them here. Let's go with this first question, which is also interesting to me. If I'm building a game with NFTs, do I need to build a backend specifically dedicated to Immutable X? Uh, essentially, no. What You need the backend for your game, but it will be as easy as implementing APIs. So essentially, we know that people don't want to have to deal with the hassle of trying to work out uh, how to you know, work out Solidity code, work out how to set up their own nodes in order to interact with the blockchain and hook it up with their own database. We're trying to make that as easy as possible. Fantastic. And then is there a plan to get Genesis cards onto the IMX platform? Or how, how, are, how, are that, how is that going to happen? So this one is a really, really interesting question. And we have a couple of proposals internally. Uh, we want to get Genesis cards onto Immutable X. Depending on the gas price, this could be a hugely expensive endeavor to do, like 10 million plus uh, in order to get them all on, millions of dollars. Uh, what our current plan is essentially is uh, we're putting together a couple of plans and we are going to uh, ask the community essentially which one of these are uh, most appealing to them. I'm sure that we're going to get some interesting results, but at the end of the day, uh, these are your assets and we want to do with them what is going to be best for you guys who own them. 
Uh, obviously, if they're on Immutable X, there's some huge benefits, right? Because mm -hmm. that's where all the trading is going to be focused. And I'm sure many people are going to want to uh, have it on there uh, in order to participate in that. Okay, cool. Fantastic. Here's a question about uh, gaming, the nature of gaming. For traditional games, there has always been a space for secondary market trading. Even in Diablo 2, I remember, I remember uh, Diablo 2, there was secondary market activity as well. Traditionally, this erodes the player's sense of fairness. How do you go about avoiding a pay-to-win model in a game like Gods Unchained? Yeah, so this was one of the great, great problems that we make sure that we wanted to try and solve when we first you know, designed Gods Unchained. Uh, there's a couple of things which are really, really important uh, in game design for these sorts of games. And we think that uh, one of the things that we're going to be probably doing eventually, uh, along with Immutable X, is probably like starting to open source a lot of the game and economic design documents that we have around this. So in Gods Unchained, some cards sell for a huge amount of money, some cards sell for almost nothing. How do you make sure that you are not just directly selling power uh, in a way that's perceived as unfair by players in a way that will ruin their enjoyment or hinder the growth of the game? There's a couple of ways. One, people won't only just pay for power. So people will pay for status. And in Gods Unchained, what we've done is make sure that you can buy, uh, you know, there's shadow versions of cards, golden versions, diamond versions, et cetera. And that's ways that you can uh, continue to spend and be appealing to people who want to spend by, by offering them status rather than offering them an in-game advantage. At the same time, as items become more and more unique, you need to make sure maybe you can offer new experiences. Uh, maybe you can offer extra content and extra experiences, but you can't offer something that is strictly superior or it just erodes at people's sense of fairness. At the same time, we've done a huge amount of work about how to uh, essentially make sure that we protect the economies in these games as well. You don't want what happened to Diablo 3, the auction house, to happen to a blockchain game, right? Where you have infinite supply, people who just go crazy, they're constantly making stuff. We've done some amazing uh, R&D internally that we'll be releasing pretty soon for God's Unchained. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when Clay's going to roll out the update for what we're going to do to the metagame for that. But essentially, how do you algorithmically uh, bring in caps uh, as well as other mechanisms which stop overinflation of supply while also making sure that they're dynamic, they're accessible. Uh, we're pretty excited to reveal later what we've done on this front. You guys are forging some new ground in these these gaming like monetary economics. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's going to be fascinating, I think, in the, in the future for games to sort of learn from this experience. Um, one question I have, James, when you were mentioning status is, it, has this become a thing yet? So like, tracing the lineage of a particular card or an item in the game. So let's say somebody super famous like David Hoffman, you know, owns this God's Unchained card. And I, I want do. that card just because David owned it. Has, <laughs> has that become a thing yet in the gaming world? Or do you think it will become a thing in that st status bucket? 100% that will become a thing. Okay. So it has been hard to make it a thing so far because the infrastructure around truly unique items and searching for them hasn't quite been there and the liquidity around that hasn't quite been there either. But what we want to do for Immutable X, and one of our big goals is be, and this is why we would never compromise by switching to something like 1155s or using something which is only semi-fungible. You need to be able to create completely unique items. It gives so much value to influencers, <laughs> content creators, right. streamers, etc. What we would like is if you were playing Gods Unchained and you're a streamer and you have the ability to sell your cards right there through Immutable X, through that streaming platform. And because Immutable X is APIs, uh, like we could build this or one of the listeners, if you're a developer, chat to us go build this, like we, we're fee sharing, we're you know, cutting people in, all participants who build on top of this will uh, prosper essentially. It's the way we're designing this protocol. Um, and ultimately the ability to empower this captures something that has never existed in the digital realm before. So the boxing gloves that Muhammad Ali used to knock out George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle fight, they're worth over a million dollars. 
the exact same boxing gloves from that same year made by that same company that were not used in that fight are uh, they're worthless they are completely <laughs> worthless who captures that value in the gaming world there's no value to capture who, who could capture that value how can we incentivize and allow the people who distribute it the to tap into the power of their own celebrity influence uh, the value that they're bringing to it and capture value from that and that's something we're very interested in empowering people to be able to do this is super cool. Another question coming from YouTube. When is God's Unchained coming to mobile? So God's Unchained mobile, I, I don't want to uh, be a little bit of a, uh, a big tease, but I have a version of it on my phone right now. <laughs> that uh, is a tease. <laughs> in terms of, there's a couple of things we need to get it to the level that we're happy enough with, and then we're going to do a soft launch with it um, in a you know we're trying to work out is it going to be australia is it going to be uh canada for the soft launch uh essentially the goal is to have this soft launch in uh q2 uh, of 2021 uh for us uh like we've been chatting a lot to the big you know the apples the googles and everyone to make sure that we can make this uh like properly so it doesn't get pulled. It, making this mainstream for us is not something that we want to rush. It's something that we were, are going about 100% seriously and intentionally and making sure that the, the mobile game is a good game matters. Well, there's been all of the uh, the Fortnite Apple kind yeah. of news lately. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you guys are paying attention to that. That was a crazy and ballsy move by Tim Sweeney uh, when he decided <laughs> that he ha had had it with mm -hmm. Apple's Monopoly. And ultimately, uh, like, I guess one of the beauties of crypto is that rather than taking the monopoly for ourselves, we get to share it. We get to not only share it, we get to programmably share it. And when you, you know, when the code itself that programmably shares stuff and increases value is immutable, then people, that's the foundation for which the new economy is going to be built on. James, one of the frequent topics around NFTs and, and gaming and specifically inspired by Gonsolin Train is the ability to rent out your cards or rent out your deck. Uh, are you guys working on infrastructure like this? As soon as we have, so our main goal by far is liquidity. So the ability to be able to sell any card pretty reasonably without much slippage, that's our number one focus for the Immutable X platform. At the same time, our whole team wants to be able to allow uh, lending. And after that, you know, uh, collateralization, futures, all these different parts. Uh, it is firmly in our vision. It's not on the roadmap for the next six months. That is get this, like get this amazing exchange protocol up and allow and really stoke as much liquidity as we possibly can as we keep on improving it. But after then, it is extremely interesting to us. What about on the DeFi side of things? Have you guys chewed on the ability to produce a, a Gauze Unchained cards index? Like maybe Gauze Unchained gets really, really popular. And, but maybe you don't really want to sp buy specific cards, but you do want upside exposure to the growth of the overall set of Gauze Unchained cards. Is, is it possible to produce a Gauze Unchained index token? I'm not sure who's been uh, speaking within your ear, but that's <laughs> another, another feature that we are super excited about so look why are we excited to buy it if we can allow people to create indexes for any sort of bundle of items that they want mm -hmm. inside immutable x and we democratize that to other people being able to create it then suddenly erc 721s can be kept within immutable x and you can turn them into erc 20s which represent you know fractional ownership mm -hmm. or of this index and at that point pulling them out and interacting with the rest of the DeFi ecosystem. One, it's already built for ERC-20s. Two, the gas problems just aren't as bad for ERC-20s. And so we see an eventual strong use case of uh, Immutable X being the place where everyone with whatever game can turn their fungible items into a collection, into an index, and allow people to be able to create ERC-20s out of them that can be interacted with the rest of the interoperable DeFi scene. What about getting even more granular? Because I remember back in my Hearthstone days, uh, there were when a new deck would come out, 
people would be hypothesizing or guessing like, all right, well, this new, this new expansion pack that's coming out, that's going to be like this. And that's going to really impact like Druid characters, Druid decks or, or priest decks. Could we even get even more granular? What if we had like a, uh, I'm, I'm not too savvy with the categories of types of decks that immutable offers, but like we could have like a, you said deception, a deception ETF specifically in that category versus other things that, that sounds like if the ecosystem grows that large to need something like that, it could be pretty, pretty interesting. Completely. Like, um, th- when I say the, that like our goal is to have Goldman Sachs going long deception and all the <laughs> YFIs are uh, doing that, this is the tool that I imagine that they would use. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the same time, in a way, we have a product actually which is uh, like chests of unopened cards. Uh, in a way, that's mm-hmm. like the basic primitive of what these sure. indexes could be. There's a level of randomness in there, huh. obviously, because you don't actually know that it's not one of everything. It's just a probabilistic chance of an, a certain amount of each one. Mm-hmm. But th- for us, that's a primitive and that we're learning a, quite a lot about. And then uh, eventually we get to upgrade it to just being create your own indexes. Let's see which ones are popular. Uh, how can we offer, allow this to give value to people? Very cool. Very cool. One last question I have for you is what's the business model of the Immutable X platform? So essentially, uh, it's going to be a small fee on the sale and trading of items. Uh, It will always be less than, which is beautiful. Uh, It's going to be less, like the the cost to create something for all devs uh, will always be less than what it would be to mint it on the main chain. It's super important to us. So this like percentage has a a cap on it and I'm pretty sure the cap is $10 or something. So if you want to mint a, currently it's incredibly uneconomical to create anything on the main chain. I think the God's Unchained packs for us to create on the main chain and the cards is just stupid Um, because the average value of each of them is, you know, a dollar or a couple of dollars, et cetera. But there are some items which are incredibly rare and some items are worth sixty, a hundred thousand uh, dollars. It will be cheaper to mint them inside Immutable X as well. James, this has been a super cool. Ask me anything. I think I think a few things that that I guess I'm hearing. One thing I'm hearing is you guys are essentially creating a shard for NFTs, right? A shard on top of Ethereum that anybody who has an NFT, whether it's Rarible or whether it's an art project or whether it's another game, can come join. And the beauty of this is it's credibly neutral, right? Like it all ultimately settles to this open financial property management system that that we call Ethereum. And what I really love about what Gods Unchained is doing is you guys are playing the long game. I look at the the crypto uh, gaming industry And I see a lot of games that quite frankly are just playing the short game and they're chasing kind of money, whether it's like uh, selling to their community in a way that is very short term, not thinking about the long term economics or just jumping on the next Ethereum killer that bribes them with uh, some easy cash or some press, right? You guys are not doing that. You are playing the long game. You're building a home here. Uh, and that to me is is super exciting. But I feel like uh, there's an element, James, where like you've been wanting to say some things about your upcoming product roadmap, and we want to hear what's coming next with Gods Unchained. Is there anything you can say to the bankless community about what is coming next? Because I feel like you've got some exciting things in store. So I've hinted at these a little bit, and I've got to make sure that I don't say anything that the marketing department uh, is going to get me in trouble with. But obviously, <laughs> the do first it, big do things, it. <laughs> uh, Immutable X is going to be a game changer for Gods Unchained. Uh, the ability to be able to trade these items gas-free is going to be huge uh, and instantly as well. So building that out and getting that integrated with Gods Unchained uh, as best we can is one of the most important things. The next thing that we're very interested in is making sure that our metagame, one, can delight and you know gives the traditional free-to-play experience and all the best parts of that, but takes advantage of Immutable X. So we are very, very interested to make sure that uh, sort of our metagame and uh, like the upgrade to the economy that that's going to bring 
uh, and the huge upgrade to play to earn that that is going to, to bring uh, makes it the best advantage of Immutable X and the other learnings that we've had in the space over time. So a couple of the learnings that we've had were we did a, uh, we've had raffle tokens before that people could play to earn, uh, which were ERC-20s. We've had, uh, you know, versions of ERC-721s and NFTs, which people could play to earn. Uh, the, the next version, uh, which brings it all together and sort of the culmination of our learnings and we're making sure that we have at the same time as Immutable X is the one that we think uh, is going to be incredibly fascinating for Gods Unchained and where the team is super excited by it. Uh, we've been calling it Project Rocket internally. One thing I've noticed about uh, gaming platforms on Ethereum and most saliently Gods Unchained is that the community that you guys have developed is actually uniquely different from the DeFi crypto community that I find that me and Ryan find ourselves in every single day. And I, well, that's one, one reason why I find crypto gaming so incredibly compelling as an on-ramp to get people who are not crypto people to become crypto people. You know, you know, pull them. It's, it's like the the white van with candy in it, except now it's just that the the Hearthstone remake with. <laughs> Whoops! The, with you the ac accidentally bought a like self sovereign bear and bond <laughs> yeah. game item. What does that even mean? Like, oh, this has real market value. You know, all the other things that make these five so incredibly cool can actually be expressed inside of Hearthstone or, or of Gauze Unchained. And like, I'm actually I'm seeing the very vibrant Gauze Unchained community in the YouTube comments, and so they've definitely followed you here. Uh, biting on your every word to hear about what's coming out of Immutable Next. And so uh, tip of the hat for generating that very unique and, and compelling community outside of DeFi, because that is not an easy challenge, sir. Well, the tip of the hat goes to the Gods Unchained community uh, rather than to us. Essentially, if, if you build the infrastructure and you continually focus on the long game and keep on trying to deliver value, then... Uh, communities who are interested in that gather and they form their own culture. These are the economies of the future, aren't they? I, I really believe that. Completely. So James, if uh, people who are not yet in the Gods Unchained community, where should they go to join it or just to overall find out more information about Gods Unchained and Immutable and Immutable X? Awesome. So for information around Gods Unchained, godsunchained.com. For information around Immutable and Immutable X, immutable.com. Uh, you can download the game Gods Unchained for free if you're interested. Uh, there's, there's tutorials. You can start earning cards. You can start earning items and get eventually, you know, uh, this stuff is all going to be on Immutable X. So you'll get your first items, uh, your first self-sovereign gaming items, uh, and you can earn it that way. All right, guys, you heard the man. Meanwhile, since so many people who are watching this are new, make sure you like and subscribe the video. We put out a ton of DeFi bankless content all the time, just like this. And so if you subscribe, you will get notified of that future content. So make sure you do that. And also with Goss Unchained, one last question. Is there social gaming yet? Can I play, like, can I connect to a specific friend and play him? Because I know my Goss Unchained username. So like, is that, can I like add a friend? Is that a feature yet? So we haven't built the friends list inside it, but we have built the ability to directly challenge uh, and essentially have a 1v1 against whoever you want. Uh, and I think you mentioned that you were playing maybe a couple of months ago. So mm -hmm. this one's new since then and okay. has had really good uptake. Okay, well, my username is Trustless State, so which is also my Twitter name. And so the next time I log into Gods Unchained, uh, I will be spamming out that, that uh, username so people can challenge me. Awesome. All right, guys, James, thank you so much, Bankless Nation. This has been another AMA on the Bankless Nation. Like, subscribe. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Thanks, everyone.